morning everyone uh once again for uh, art conversation we have another wonderful uh, personality straight from uh, london uk and uh, we have with us uh, professor uh, helen nicholson welcome helen thank you very much it's delightful to be talking to you yeah uh, so uh, i'll just quickly introduce uh, helen works at uh, uh, royal holloway university of london as a professor of uh, theater and performance a wonderful teacher and a researcher who wrote several brilliant books uh, she is also awarded for her work by american alliance of uh, theater and education and the uh, tapra editing prize she is a fellow of the higher education academy fellow of the royal society of arts associate fellow of uh, humberton college and uh, university of cambridge and also a visiting professor at the university of stockholm who helen that's a wonderful uh, introduction and uh, good to well, that's very embarrassing thank you <laughs> <laughs> not really not really you have really done a wonderful job we read your books we refer your books and i think that made our practice uh, uh, quite matured in a way so thank you very much for that uh thank you. so you have wrote a lot about applied theater so we'll start with that so very basic thing i would like to know what exactly applied theater mean to you well, it's a very good question and i think my view of it has changed and evolved over time i think uh when i wrote my book in 1994 um 2004 yeah. um applied drama i don't really distinguish between applied drama and applied theater yeah. then it seemed like a relatively new term it was a term that was coined in the 1990s and it felt to me that there was a real need to engage with all the kinds of practices that um were undertaken for communities with and by and for communities and there wasn't really an umbrella term that brought together things like uh, reminiscence work or um, theatre for development or theatre education all these kind of terms were very separate but it seemed to me that there were some common intellectual and creative strands that run ran through all of them and also some distinctive differences and why i was attracted originally to the term was it seemed to me to provide an opportunity to really think through what the political consequences were of a variety of different sorts of practices so at the time i think it served a useful purpose i think it was also very helpful in, in universities where it originated because it gave us a way to think about the the different ways in which practices could come together right. so the very distinctive practices but also really there are commonalities too and it gave us that opportunity to think through what they might be in terms of our teaching as well as our research right i think over time it's evolved and i think um when james thompson and i were both writing our our books on applying theatre around about the same time our, our first books and um I, I think at the time it really was an intention to define an area to really kind of raise some critical questions about what people were doing I think over time it's evolved um, it's coming up for 20 years since uh, that that work was done and I think um, quite rightly it's been opened out and critiqued and professionalized and there are all sorts of multiple meanings of the term now but for me I think it still has its usefulness um, and people still seem to want to use it but i would perhaps uh, raise caution about it in some ways now okay so that that's more like validating uh, your own practice yeah it was um i think there was for me there was a very straightforward linear cause and effect narrative that came out of a lot of the practices that uh, i witnessed and have witnessed over the last um uh, 15 20 years right. in that often it's driven by funders and people evaluate to say uh, we went into this community we did this work and all this they were transformed the lives that were were improved and all the rest of it and undoubtedly that happens but I think to 
say that it's a very straightforward linear process is to miss the complexity of what theatre and the arts are about. And right. they are much more messy and relational and complex than that linear narrative might imply. Right. Um, whatever books you have written, you have uh, wrote on different aspects, starting from uh, uh, performance, then application of it, a uh, bit of a theory, investigating a lot of ideas also. So uh, how do you look at it, apply theater more as a practice or as a pedagogy? Well, I would never use the term applied theatre practitioner. I, I don't think such a thing exists. Okay. Um, I think there are theatre makers who apply theatre to particular social, cultural, institutional challenges. But I wouldn't suggest that there is a package or a toolkit of arts practices that you can put on like a backpack and take everywhere and apply to different contexts. I'm more personally, I'm more interested in the way in which theatre makers find inventive and creative ways to engage with different people in different settings and in different contexts. Right. What the applied bit is for me is the application of theatre and performance to, to community settings, not in itself a set of practices. Mm -hmm. And the reason for that, I think, is that as soon as we get a, a fixed set of practices, we lose the art form. Yeah. As soon as we say, right, we're now going to be doing these set of, uh, of practices, this toolkit, then we forget that there is an art form attached to it and that the art form is about being alive in the moment, being spontaneous, being able to improvise, having a body of knowledge that you can work with, which is actually rather different from having a set of games or toolkits that can be applied in any context. All right. Uh, yeah, so I'll just, I'll just uh, put something over here and you can uh, correct me if I'm wrong. So would you like to say it is more uh, a conceptual process than the contextual process? I think I probably would. That's a really interesting point. I'd never say you were wrong. Um, I think I think that the way in which I think about applied theatre is about questioning practices. I think the theatre bit of it, for me, could be multiple forms of, of theatre and performance. It might be an installation, it might be a, a, a workshop with lots of games, it might be um, a site-specific performance, it could be a scripted play, it could be all sorts of things. Um, what unites them is an intention to make a difference in the world in some way and to work with communities and not uh, impose things on them. Yeah. So I think it's a motive and it's a, a reason for doing the work, not a set of, of fixed practices that, that then get transported. Okay, again, try to make it more simpler. Do you want to say it is not about teaching, but about exploring? Yes. All right, great. Yes, I think the idea of uh, applied theatre, it's, for me, it's, it's exploratory, it's about improvising, it's about being responsive to the environment in which you're working, it's about, it's about, it's about reciprocity, it's about relationships, right. it's about relationality, it's about how we engage with people rather than doing things for people. Absolutely. It's about uh, listening in a really radical, deep way, it's about listening with your body, it's about listening uh, intellectually and it's about uh, always being alert if you like to new possibilities right. so I don't think it's a fixed way of doing things but I think there are uh, I think to be exploratory is a really good way of putting it yes okay great uh, so you did this uh, project called values of applied theater and the outcome of it is a very beautiful book you have written applied drama the gift of theater so uh, thank you after like uh, 15 years now, how do you look at it? Uh, how one should look at the area of uh, applied theater? Like what were the discoveries? And if somebody is coming, uh, a very new person coming into this area wants to work, how they should look at it? Um, I think 
that's a really good question. How would a young person look at it? I think uh, somebody coming new to the field, uh, one of the most important things that they can do is really question why they want to do the work. Um, why do they want to work in with particular communities? What can they learn about that setting? And um, what can they learn about people's lives before they engage with the work? So, for example, I heard about a really beautiful project um, working with uh, old people in care homes. And obviously one of the issues that is very current here is increasing numbers of people living in care homes with dementia and uh, often quite isolated from their families and needing constant care. Right. And the care can be quite functional. Um, and where the artists come in is to bring the joy and the uh, excitement and the stimulus into their lives. And I was working, been working in this area for some time. And one of the things that I always say to people is go and experience it. Just see how people live before you jump in saying, I'm going to change it. Work with what's there. See what, what, what is already rich within that community. Uh, really uh, listen, engage, and then work very gently to try and find out what, how you can make a difference to, to lives, rather than kind of charging in, I am an artist and I'm now going to create all this wonderful stuff that yes. you will enjoy. You know, there's, there's take time. Right. I think that's what I would say. So there was a lovely example of a lovely project where uh, two young artists went and just lived in a care home with older people. They were artists in residence, literally living alongside the old people. And the first thing they did on the first night or very early on was they said, the, the residents said, well, we, we never really have much fun and we have to go to bed early. Can we stay up a bit later and have a party? So they went out and got food for a party and they, everybody came together and had a party. Now, that was being responsive. It was listening. It was really tuning in to the place where they were uh, where they were living and I think that would be my first piece of advice tune in okay so getting getting along uh, with the uh, stakeholders that you're working with that is one thing okay uh, yes alongside I'm getting uh, on some practical viewpoints uh, it's a very time-consuming process when you actually want to get engaged with the community and you're talking about transformation, right? Uh, yeah. the, the, the world is, uh, uh, it's, it's, it's on a different kind of narrative nowadays, all right? And there is no uh, possible funding available for uh, such things. Uh, when somebody wants to get into this kind of work, how do they develop this entrepreneurship spirit of creating their own work and managing all these things, considering that they really want to make uh, some difference with their work? It's a really difficult question to answer because I think your the implication of your question is absolutely right that change happens cumulatively. It it it, it takes time. Yeah. Um, and we know that from you know from learning yeah. uh, you know, learning is iterative it's spiral you don't just learn one thing and then if you don't practice it then you forget it you know it, we all develop incrementally and I think the problem often is uh, short-term funding streams that don't allow people to really uh, do what I was saying earlier about becoming attuned to a place, to the communities, to the participants. You know, they're expected to come in, deliver, evaluate, say it was great, right, and off you the next one. Um, and I think there's a job of work that that those of us who do research can can do to talk to funders and to explain to them that this does take time. Um, one of the projects that I, I did with, uh, I'm going back to the dementia project actually because it's just on my mind, is we demonstrated through really careful um, psychological mapping that uh, the quality of life of the people improved incrementally over weeks. 
Okay. So it, it wasn't uh, a quick fix. You couldn't just go in and run a three hour workshop and people's quality of life or mood would improve. Right. Gradually, they got used to it and they improved. And that, that evidence uh, base gave the artist something to really work with with the funders because they said well we can't go in and just do a five-week project because you'll only get a quarter of the benefit we need to have a 20-week project and that's where i think as as researchers we do well to work with the with the scientists and the social scientists who will not only um offer kind of key insights like that but they'll offer really valuable evidence that people can take to funders that will allow us as artists to work more incrementally and over time. Um, and I think I'd rather, I would rather see people work in depth over a longer period of time and then move on to another community or wow. organization or whatever, than try to do too much and rush around doing, doing a little everywhere. Because those people whose lives get, get changed more profoundly will influence other people you know it yeah. will yeah. It, there will be a viral and um, and but those people who perhaps just experience a, a couple of hours and then it's gone i think it actually only makes a tiny dent so i think we need to be careful i think the answer to your question i would say is we need to work in an interdisciplinary way as researchers to give the to give the kind of evidence that people need it needs to be more than uh, the supposition of artists and, and arts academics like me who will say uh, yes this needs to happen we need to demonstrate in other ways too right well i think i, I was really not uh, looking at a particular answer for this because the question is very uh, critical in that sense but that that is what is exactly happening like when you want to work with some school for a longer duration uh, there are challenges of uh, you know uh, getting a working hours, then uh, holidays, examinations, a uh, lot of, again, interest of parents also, that also need to be yes. negotiated, uh, you know, uh, well in advance and uh, having a clear uh, dialogue with them because everyone wants to know what will going to happen at the end. And the beauty of applying yes. is you cannot tell them at uh, day one, right? Yeah. And I think we live in such a target driven culture. Yeah. Um, everything is based on uh, realizing uh, and meeting targets. Okay. And, uh, and that is to the detriment of life, actually, in many ways, um, because life doesn't work like that. You don't, you don't uh, necessarily succeed uh, emotionally, spiritually, in any other way by meeting targets. Absolutely. and delivering things to meet targets it's not about it's not life isn't about that and i think uh, within this terrible awful uh, situation we're all finding ourselves in now i think one of the things we are all doing is reassessing what really matters in life right um and and you know the basics in life are really important that everybody has access to to home and clean water and and so on and that um, relationships can be built and sustained over time and I think people are really taking time to assess that at the minute so I don't know what will come out of the current lockdown but maybe we will all emerge just a little bit wiser right well we we all hope for the same okay we'll be uh, changed for sure. yeah, yeah we have to we have to that's a very uh, yes. alarming time nowadays and if we haven't changed that uh, it will going to be a miracle that we cannot see okay. yeah yeah exactly yeah so uh so you have done a project called public acts yes right so would you like to like yeah. i think your smile says that you well, want to talk about it this this is really interesting because this is uh, a project that was set up by the National Theatre in London. Now the National Theatre is an iconic uh, theatre in uh, which exists uh, in the centre of London on London South Bank in the cultural quarter really. Um, but also it, uh, its education programme, its learning programme spreads out nationally. Now 
they have a relatively new artistic director, Rufus Norris, and he recognised that the national of national theatre uh, was only actually a very small part of the nation. Mm -hmm. And what he wanted to do was to engage uh, more people in making theatre as well as seeing theatre. So they set up a programme called Public Acts, which is based loosely on a sister project in uh, New York, Public Works. Yeah. And Public Acts worked, with, first year worked in London, two years worked in London, with community groups. So people who are engaged in making a difference to people's lives. So people who work with homeless, people who work with uh, children in care, people who work with um, uh people who experienced childhood trauma, a range of different charities like that. And they embedded, they embedded artists in these charities for a period of, of about eight, nine months, um, really working intensively. And that was a really good example, I think, of, of, of tuning in to the needs of the partners. Right. So they didn't go in going, they really didn't and I watched this and I was quite skeptical because I thought they might be. they didn't go in going we are the National Theatre we are now going to bring our wonderful drama workshops to you they really listened to what the the charities wanted uh, them to do they might be health charities so they worked with the kind of agendas that the charities were setting up and and working with and they also acknowledged as artists that it was actually the charities that were making a difference there to these people's lives. They were working with them over the long term. Right. What they could do was enhance that process and give it another dimension. So they, uh, they did this. I was, part, I was leading the research on it. Uh, and the first year they did a spectacular production, an adaptation of Shakespeare's Pericles in the Olivia Theatre, which is one of the largest stages in the world. Mm -hmm. And I think it was joyful. And what it reminded me of, and this is something that James was saying on your other recording, is, is actually theatre gives people the opportunity to have some joy in their lives, to escape from some of the the, the, the troubles that they face True. to really cut and you could feel it in rehearsals there was there was dancing there was singing there was a real sense of, of of joyfulness and people finding the opportunity to really find something new in themselves that wasn't about their past or their experience but it was about the here and now and finding something magical in that moment so um that uh, and then the second year, it uh, went to another of the London theatres, the Queen's Theatre Horn Church, where they did a, a brilliant, a beautiful job uh, working again with the same people, but bringing together a production of As You Like It. And it's interesting when I talk about this project, because people, when they hear the National Theatre is going out to work in communities, then they assume, some of them, that it's a slightly patronising uh, uh, process it, that it's that they are assuming that they are doing something new which has actually been done in many different ways over many different different years and actually I've not found that I found there's a real humility amongst the people at the National Theatre who recognize that the only way in which this theatre can really be be national is to engage with with people and communities who don't turn up to watch uh, plays in their very expensive seats mm. I think I was uh, about to ask about how to increase the public participation, but uh, you have already uh, discussed a lot about it. And I think that more and more efforts need to be taken with this uh, uh, premier organizations in uh, each country, including India. We have uh, National School of Drama and uh, they need to uh, take out these efforts to reach out to tier two, tier three cities where uh, uh, theater is not reached out in that sense. All right. Yeah. So, uh, I think coming to an end, uh, there is one question which I'm asking. Yeah. Can you hear me? Hello. I can't hear you. Can you hear Hello. me? Yeah, I can. Can you hear Sound's me now? Sound is gone. Sound is gone. Uh, can you hear me now? I can. Yes. Thank you. Okay, okay. So I was just uh, coming to an end question, which 
I like to ask to all of those who are in the area of uh, applied theater, either uh, teaching, working, doing research and a lot of things. What do you think, what is the future of applied theater? I think it's a, that's a really good question. I don't think there's one answer to that. I think there will be uh, different approaches to applied theatre in different places. I think, I think there will be a blurring of the lines between the theatre and applied theatre. I think in the UK, I'm seeing pretty much all the major theatres wanting to engage in this kind of work. Right. So it's becoming more mainstream. It, 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 where applied theatre started, I think, or the, where it, the umbrella term was, began to be used, was because all these different practices felt a little bit marginal. And they're now becoming much more mainstream. Theatres are really beginning to engage with communities in all kinds of different ways. And that might be through different forms of technology or different sorts of immersive theatre, as well as the kind of public um, acts programme that I've just described. So I think there will be more attention by the mainstream theatre professionals to the kind of work that we've been doing. I think the other thing that may happen and it's difficult to predict is that we become more conscious of the local in our work mm -hmm. i think over the the last few years then there has been a greater consciousness of what's in our neighborhood and how we can support locally our communities and particularly for Westerners who, you know, had a habit of uh, doing work in uh, developing countries yes. and in the global south. Um, some of it welcome, some of it uh, less so, I'd say. I think the climate change, I think uh, the way in which we are thinking more about um, uh, the problems, the power relations of that kind of work, I think there will be more and more uh, locally based work and people really engaging with the people that are in their local communities and in their, 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 their regions rather than rushing across the world trying to empower and transform other people. Right, I think that's, that's so, right. You know, I think the, the kind of, sh the, the younger generation, their shift towards consuming less, flying less, uh, will have an impact. Right. Um, and what I hope is that we are able to continue these international dialogues, such as this lovely conversation that you very yeah. kindly set up here. Um, but that, that, and that there will be travel, of course there'll be travel. Travel could be a very important way of sharing ideas. But that also we reconnect with what is local, what is sustainable, and and uh, and and make sure that our practice is is something that that is always for the the good of the planet as well as the good of the people. Right. I think I could hear a lot of uh, a sense of uh, uh, hope and positivity in what you are talking. Just at the last, uh, wanted to know what do you think? What need to do? This this practice is very important the uh, application of theater uh, in schools and uh, different kind of community settings, prisons, uh, even corporate and industries is very important. What do you think, what efforts need to be taken to uh, take it across? I think you're absolutely right that applied theater is a really important way of people engaging uh, in all kinds of different contexts. So if it's uh, about corporate change and culture changes in, in organizations, then uh, theater can really enable people to engage with the questions that really matter to them. And this is more than just setting targets. It's about really encouraging people to care about the work that they do. And that might be the same in a care home for older people, or it might be in a prison, it might be in all kinds of contexts, but it enables people to really find out and, and work with and explore why they do the work they do and how they can make that work make a difference to others. Right. It's a creative way 
really engaging with different kinds of questions and, and, and challenges that we all face, both in our work lives and, our, and in our daily lives. So I think one of the things that applied theatre can do is to really take time in each of those different settings to learn about the settings, whether it's a school or a prison or a care home or a corporate setting, because each of those situations is different. And not only is a prison different from a school, different from a, a business, but each school is different and has got different uh, cultures and, and ways of working. Right. And in order for Applied Theatre to really engage and to encourage young people, let's say, to, uh, to think creatively and to imagine the world to be a, uh, in all kinds of different places, then that takes time. And that's where theatre practitioners working alongside and in an organization a very deep way can really make a difference. That's wonderful. Uh, I can imagine that uh, in a couple of years, uh, we can see theater everywhere, including schools, on roads, parks, uh, old age homes, uh, uh, you name it and we can see it. And I hope that that, that need to happen, that should happen. Uh, the theatre need to come out from a proscenium uh, theatre and it should go to to the people, to their place, right? Yeah. I think yes, that's, absolutely. Yeah, yeah uh, that, that's a very, very positive note uh, and uh, we, can, we can stop here. Of course, we will continue doing uh, a lot of dialogues in the uh, coming days, but uh, as of now, we'll stop here and uh, I really want to thank you for your time and uh, your exchange. Uh, again, uh, I think you're coming up, coming up with uh, some, some book now. Am I writing anything at the minute? Yeah. Uh, not, not at the moment. I've okay. got some ideas for the uh, kind of the, what the answer to your, your last question is, is, right. you know, what's the future? So we'll see, watch this space. Okay, that's wonderful. So we'll, we'll wait for it and I, I'm sure that it will be as amazing as your other books are. But uh, Helen, well, thank you very yeah. much for uh, being here today. Thank you very much for your time. And uh, Thank you. It's an absolute, absolute joy and, and, and a real pleasure. And thank you very, very much. And thank you for all your inspirational work too. Right. Thank you very much and stay safe. Don't roam around. Stay safe. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Good luck to your work. Bye-bye. And to you. Bye-bye.